Hey guys, thanks for joining me on Anthology of Heroes, a podcast sharing stories of heroism and defiance from across the ages. Today we're joined by James Waterson, an author who wrote, among many other books, The Knights of Islam, The War of the Mamluks. The Mamluks are a fascinating group. They were slaves taken from the Mongol steppe who were raised into elite Islamic soldiers. These guys were the cream of the crop. They could shoot faster than a Mongol, charge harder than a crusader, and had all range of grenades and other explosives up their sleeves. So it's no real surprise that they end up overthrowing their enslavers and establishing a dynasty. Yeah, just like the Unsullied in Game of Thrones. Baybars is the most famous of all Mamluks. A defender of Islam from both the Crusaders and the Mongols, he's a big deal. And if it wasn't for his unbelievable victory at Anjalut, how far would the Mongols have advanced? As James says, Saladin is the greatest Muslim warrior in the eyes of the West, but it's the story of Baybars that gets the coffee shops of Damascus roused into cheer. So James is going to take us through it. As a reminder, you can watch this interview on YouTube too. Links are in the show notes below. Let's get into it. The story of Baybars. Uh, James, thank you very much for joining me on Anthology of Heroes. How are you going today? I'm all right, apart from, you know, the dreaded lurgy that's coming the rounds. It doesn't matter if you're in Europe or Western Asia, you're going to get it somewhere, I think, this that's year. True. That's it may true, not be yeah. COVID, but it's going to be something equally nasty. <laughs> Can you give me a bit about your background first? Yeah, um, I'm probably what they would call a bit of a drifter, to be quite honest. These days, I'm a health economist and medical affairs officer for a large faceless American corporation, which is pretty much the day job, and that keeps me mostly in Africa and uh, Western Asia, um, with a little bit of time in Europe now and again when I get lucky. Um, But I spent my early life uh, in healthcare, but also in university teaching. Uh, I spent about seven years between Nanjing and Shanghai as a university lecturer, a few years in the US. doing healthcare, doing nursing, a couple of years in the oil industry, drifting around. I don't think that was, I'm trying to think, tried to find my, tried to write my first novel when I was on an oil rig, which was fairly awful and we should not talk about that. Um, I think the first article I ever wrote on the Mamluks was written in Shanghai on a broken ironing board with a half-dead laptop. When I sold my apartment there and I was on my way back to um, Italy at that point, actually. Um, And it was a lucky strike. I was reading, I better get this right, really, considering I owe them a huge debt, uh, History Magazine. Okay. And I wrote to them and I said, would you be interested in this piece on this very unusual military cast? Um, And they were very positive, you know, and it was like, I don't think I what did they pay you back then, 75 pounds or something, you know, but it was very nice. Um, and then the article was picked up by a small publisher, North London publisher, uh, Greenhill Books, Michael Leventhal, who still publishes a fantastic range of uh, cookery books um, for uh, Jewish cookery books and also children's books as well. And uh, you know, one of those great people that you meet that will take the risk, you know, with, right. with what is potentially very, again, as I say, very small niche audience potentially uh, because one thing we do know about the Mamluks and and, and obviously Babers who we hope to speak to speak about in detail today is not much known you know, very little known um, I do remember how however my old university was uh, SOAS the School of Oriental and African Studies and on day one you were given the drill by the Chancellor who essentially said you people are all studying ridiculous minority subjects. Some of you are studying Burmese, study, studying law for Cameroon and things like this. It is your secondary mission to go out in the world and proselytize and inform everybody else about these minority subjects. So it, it was quite nice because I think in, um, I think in my second book on the assassins, uh, Professor David Morgan actually wrote that in the foreword that I'd taken this perhaps rather over over enthusiastically <laughs> that this was part of a trilogy on the on the Middle East. It started with the Mamluk dynasty working slightly backwards perhaps, and then uh, the Ismaili assassins, and then a book concentrating quite strongly on the early counter crusaders leading up to Salah al-Din and, and, and through to that. And you end up with the Mamluks. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I always feel you can't escape the Mamluks in Middle Eastern history, but the, the greater 
the greater statement at SOAS was always you can't escape the Mongols. It doesn't matter if you study Chinese history. It doesn't matter if you study mm. Indian history. It doesn't matter if you study Eurasian history. You're going to meet the Mongols at some point. And again, I think that's why the Mamluks are so centrally important, because after a huge run of success, going all the way up to 1241, even defeating Teutonic Knights in Legnix and Sayo, the subjugation of China, okay, it took a very long time, but eventually it was achieved. Only the Mamluks really essentially stand against the, Mon the Mongols and actually stop them at Ain Jalut in 1260 and stop that run of success. Um, hmm. So I think they're, they're, they're worthy of study for that reason alone. Um, but they're also one of those fascinating characteristics of Western Asia that is, and it's kept me there also as a sort of a citizen as, and, and as a resident for many years. I love the blend of the mix of peoples that come through the region. I mean, there's a very good reason why it's called the Middle East. It really is the nexus between Asia coming this way and, and, and Europe coming this way and Africa coming this way. You've got that tripartite um, join, joining there. But also, again, another old professor of mine, Colin Hayward, well, the first thing he would do when he was um, lecturing both on the Ottomans and on the Mongols, he would take the map and he would sort of tilt it slightly by 30 degrees so that you could see that the whole of Iran, the whole of Iraq, right down into the central lands of the Middle East is one giant corridor from Asia. Hmm. And I, rem I remember myself lecturing on the Mongols some time ago and why the Mamluks were so important in stopping them in the Middle East for Europe was that essentially Europe is a small peninsula of Asia. Hmm. So, you know, if the Mongols keep coming, they just keep coming. They're already in Russia. They've been very successful there. They're already sitting just beyond the Hungarian plains. If they, they're already in Iran, they've crushed one of the major constituent powers of the medieval world. If they don't get stopped, the Mediterranean lies open. Mm. And who knows? I mean, John Mann wrote in the, in the foreword, who obviously written, has, has written extensively on Chinggis Khan and Kublai Khan, wrote in the foreword to, to uh, Knights of Islam that if they'd got access to the navies of the Middle East, then the, the Mongols would have had a very good chance of conquering Southern Europe and coming the mm. same way as the great Arab conquests came. I'm not entirely convinced because the maritime republics of Italy were particularly strong in the Crusades period. It would not have been that easy, I think, to have crossed the Mediterranean. But I still think that it was very much the resources of the Middle East were huge at this point. This was one of the richest um, even with the damage of the Mongol and the Turkish invasions of the earlier centuries, still one of the richest pockets of the world. And those resources may well have taken uh, the Mongols all the way. I think it was Edward Gibbon who said, you know, we may be teaching Mongolian in Oxford or something. You can look at them almost like they kept out, well, everything. If if they had got past the Mamluks, the Mongols could have just kept going through, right? Almost. <laughs> I think so. I mean, let's be very honest about it as well. There was no way that the Mamluk Empire, such as it was with Egypt and Syria, was ever going to take on the full might of the Mongol Empire. It was mm. never going to occur. And mm. they did get lucky. Let's say the Babers got lucky or Kuthus, the then Sultan, got lucky in 1260 with the Battle of Ain Jalut in that those series of Mongol civil wars that eventually blew the empire apart because impressive as it was, it was very short-lived, um, were really the key to it. You know, in 1241, after the defeat of the Teutonic Knights at Lenitz and, and Sayo and of the Polish nobility, it, it, they essentially stopped because there's the first death of, um, I have to really think back in my Mongol here hmm. a little bit. Uh, I can't I not remember which great Khan. But the problem is that the Mongols, when there was an issue like that, you had obviously several different branches of the family. You have the Toluis, the Chagatais, and so on and so forth. And also, of course, you may have one father in Chinggis Khan, but you've got several different mothers. Mm. The Turkish dynasties have the same issue as well. You've got pushy mothers pushing their sons forward, etc. Right. No love lost between the chains, as we, between the actual branches of the family either. So mm. in 1241, there has been an argument that Europe was saved more by that then there was the fact that perhaps Europe wasn't that appealing to the Mongols because it wasn't absolutely the vast pasture lands that they were used to right. having with their sheep and with their horses and so on and so forth. But certainly in 1260, we see the same again when Monka dies and Kublai begins to compete with Arik Bokai 
for the throne. Now, Kublai holds China. He holds the, well, not all of China. He's still trying to conquer it, but that's the major prize. But Eric Bokai probably represents the more, uh, shall we say, earthy individuals of the of the Chinggisid Khans. Right. So they've got the Chagatai, but also the Golden Horde sitting up there in Russia that's been up in Russia since the 1220s, since the initial great Blitzkrieg, I think we can probably call it that. Sometimes we overuse that word with the Mongols because it gives that impression they come really, really, really fast, but it hmm. does take generally a long time. But this was a really massive hit very quick hmm. that destroyed um, Rus and then put them right where they were, sitting there, sitting down in the Caucasus as well. Um, so that division then, so the death of Malka, Kublai, probably the strongest candidate, has got the support of the generals, has got the support of holding China. But again, with Arak Bokai holding the passions and the uh, affections of the Chagatai horde, the more radical elements, shall we say, the more ragtag kind of guys. Poor Hulagu has been sent by Kublai, or by sent by Mulga, to invade Persia, to bring the uh, Baghdad Caliph to heel, to destroy the creed of the assassins, because they'd sent assassins against Mulga. They'd sent, some sources say, 40 assassins, some say 400 to try and kill the great Khan. So he's sitting there. He's, he's essentially finished his mission. Now he has to get into Syria, destroy the Crusaders, destroy the Mamluks to finish his mission. But there's money in the Caucasus as well. There's a lot of silver up there. So he's already in competition, competition over conquest rights with the um, with with the Golden Horde under Burke Khan, who's also converted to Islam. This is all becoming very complex because one of the things the Mongols did when they arrived in Persia was treat Islam in a, in a, in a manner that it had not been treated ever in its life. I mean, they were they actively. Um, supported Nestorian Christians. They conducted great slaughters. They construct, uh, destroyed mosques. They disestablished Islam as being the uh, essential faith of these states that they'd conquered. And they began to do the same in Syria, both in Damascus and in Aleppo as well. Um, so I think there's, there's two things that they're not facing the full might of the empire, probably at any point, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. But Baber's does something incredibly skillful out of what has been a very shaky polity. You know, the, the, Mamluk, the Mamluks come to power in 1250. They're not very good at politics for the first 10 years. And essentially, they only solidify behind one year in 1260 because the Mongols are coming and they're coming now. But what Babers does during his reign is he actually makes them like a normal state. They have mm. extensive diplomatic relations with the Golden Horde, the natural enemy of his enemy. They also reach out to the Genoese, for example, very strongly because the Genoese control the slave trade and the Mamluk Empire is built on slaves, manumitted slaves who become soldiers, hmm. become the best soldiers of the medieval age, essentially. But they also, of course, export a huge amount of the trade of the Middle East to Europe. They also become pretty strong friends with the Venetians as well. He involves himself with Charles of Anjou when he realizes that this is the guy that's going to take Sicily, a possible launching pad for a crusade for his brother, King Louis IX of France. And it's interesting that in 1270, the great crusade of, of um, Charles, uh, sorry, of Louis never gets anywhere. It gets diverted mm. to Tunis. It never meets, reaches the Holy Land. And I think Charles of Anjou has got a large hand in this. Hmm. Suddenly ships are not available. Suddenly it doesn't seem like a good idea to attack the Mamluks and so on and so forth. Um, so we've, I've, I'm sorry, I've really drifted past with a no, lot no. of events and a, and a lot of statements on this. But uh, I think that that is obviously the, the, the key that makes the Mamluk Sultanate is the Mongols. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, there's a, there's a classic line um, from an Arabic, uh, and I'm trying to think if it's Ab Ibn al Athir normally Abelfia, but I don't know that it is in this case. Um, is it Afarak? But the, the classic line is that the Mongols came to Islam, intend to destroy it, and they were destroyed by one of their own kind. Hmm. And the idea is that this parasite, this dangerous, uh, it, this dangerous entity was destroyed by people of almost exactly their own kind. 
Mm. The other interesting thing is that many of the Mamluks, in fact, possibly Babas himself, during the early Mongol invasions of the Caucasus and of, of southern Russia, a huge amount of Chipkak, uh, Chipkak Chir- Turks were displaced. They obviously also were captured by Mongols as young men, and they were sold as slaves. And they ended up in the slave markets of Cairo. They ended up in the slave markets of Damascus. Um, Babers himself went for a very cheap price. It was said that he went for as low as 10 dinar because he had an unusual eye condition. He had a cast in his eye, which some people believe was like the evil eye. Right. Um, and so he went at a bo- uh, bottom dollar price, which strange considering a man of such enormous abilities, mm. uh, whatever you feel about his ethics, whatever you feel about his uh, um the niceties of how he managed power. He's certainly one of the most incredible people of the med- medieval age. Um, whereas the sultan that followed him after Babers' son had fallen from power, Kalawun, went for a thousand. He was actually called Al Alfi, the thousand dinar, because he was so handsome right. and so tall, etc. Um, so Babers went and knocked down price. Because also there was a huge amount of slaves in the market at that point. But again, one might argue that the Mongols created their own nemesis mm. um, by captain, capturing so many of these boys and sending them into slavery. So I was, I was going to ask you on that. So can you explain the process of how a, um, a Mamluk soldier would be kind of indoctrinated into the faith? Did they, they were bought at the markets? Were they like Janissaries? Were they bought as Christians or Muslims or it didn't matter? Um, in theory, in Islam, classical Islam at that point, it is illegal to enslave a Muslim. Um, it is also illegal to enslave people of the book, which also includes the Jews and the Christians as well. Now, of course, by the time you get to the Ottomans, yes, they're absolutely, with the Dev Sherme, the, the harvest of boys, they're taking boys from the Balkans who are clearly Christian. They're putting them into farmland in Anatolia. They're converting them to Islam. They're returning as the Yenishari, the new men, the Janissaries, etc. But in classical Islam, which extends into the Mamluk period, in theory, these are pagans. Now, mm-hmm. whatever that means, let's be very liberal and open at this point. <laughs> let's not be medieval at this point about people's affiliations. Um, but I think there was a number of things going on. I think there were... Certainly, um, the, the attitude of families who were living on the steppe would be, you know, as we said with the British royal family, a spare and an heir. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got one senior boy who can take over the farm when I die as a father, but I've got some unruly boys around who are beginning to challenge my authority. This is mm-hmm. this is this is from Al Jahiz, to be honest, uh, a gentleman, an Islamic scholar from the 13th and four, I think 14th century. It's called the goggle-eyed Al Jahiz, but he uh, he observed very strongly the uh, the nature of steppe people just beyond the borders of classical Islam. He's a little bit like um, Tacitus with uh, Germania and Agricola. You know, he's one of those interesting mm-hmm. people who's looking at the customs of these people. And he says that this is the problem. You've got these unruly 13-year-old boys who are essentially adults. They can already ride. They can already shoot the bow. They're challenging the authority of the father. So they're actually put up for sale. Or they see opportunity beyond the borders of what it could be quite a hard, short, brutish life on the steppe of entering Islam and becoming a soldier. It's a little bit like being a Gurkha, right? You might go to, uh, uh, or not a Gurkha, but a potential Gurkha. Mm -hmm. You might go to a recruitment station in Nepal in the hopes that the British Army might pick you up and you're going to have a better standard of living. Again, I'd make no moral judgment here whatsoever, (laughs) just, you know, what is is opportunity to, to people like this? Having said that, there was certainly harvesting as well. There were certainly kidnappings, etc. It's very easy to transport children, of course, much easier than transporting adult slaves. And it's been suggested in the text that a relationship would be created between the ustad, the master, the person who is essentially a slave dealer, to be honest, and the very youthful Mamluk um, slaves or initiates, let, let's just call them that. They're in the slave market. They're available for being bought. So Mamluks classically are of uh, Mamluks of 10, Mamluks of 40, and Mamluks of 100. And a Mamluk of 10 is a very junior emir. He has a very low position in the Mamluk sultanate. Uh, 
Um, also, a Mamluk of fault, 40 has the right to have drums beaten, has a much larger share of the booty, and they're also essentially parts of a pyramid that builds the entire sultanate. But Babers would have been bought under the last Ayyubid sultan of Egypt, uh, Al Salah, and he had always had a massive interest in the creation of soldiers, if for want of a better term. I think you can almost call him the father of the Mamluk organization, although the history of this is incredibly long. It goes right back to the Abbasi Caliphate of Baghdad, um, certainly around even as early as 750, there were recruitment of Turks. They were separated from the population. They were given a very perfunctory form of Islam to follow. They were absolutely had adherence to the Sultan and nobody else. Um, and then Caliph al Mutasim in the early 800s formalizes this much more. And he becomes much more dependent on the Mamluks than he does on his Arab soldiery, than on his Persian soldiery. They're absolutely his men. And he builds an entire city, um, Samara, just north of Baghdad, to house and barrack these guys. Al Salah, again, very much spends much more time with his Mamluks than he does with his Ayyubid relatives, with his normal Halka, the um, Ayyubid army, the descendant army of Salahuddin. And he's really, as I say, the, the, the beginner of this process of, of a Mamluk Dum beginning. So you spend time with the Ustad, and then once you get bought by a Mamluk of 10 or a Mamluk of 40 or a Mamluk of 100, you're essentially there property, but you still go to the general tibak. You go to the barracks, you go to the place where you learn the skills of soldiering and of riding all over again. They don't care the fact that you could ride a horse since you were seven years old. You will learn again with a wooden horse how to mount, how to dismount 500 times wearing armor. You may have chopped somebody with a sword in the past, but no, you will go back to the beginning one forefinger, one thumb on the sword grip, 500 blows on a bed of clay, then a bed of lead, then a bed of lead with a, with a cushion on top, then with paper on top. So you only cut the paper and don't cut the cushion. Every single thing is two steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm. And of course, the key skill is archery. And they spend hours and hours and hours shooting with a featherless arrow with a dead head on it into what we call the butia. It's just a big barrel of straw, and they shoot at it from point-blank range just to learn the grip, as they call the falcon's grip, on the front of the bow and the string technique with the thumb and finger pulled back to the ear. This is probably at the point that I should make a very belated apology to my dear friend, Michelle, for the fact that I once destroyed a book in her library because I missed a butia that I was shooting at from point blank range and tore, <laughs> tore through one of her big fat paperbacks. So here, Michelle, here is the apology about two decades too late. Um, but this was, it, it's actually, it sounds incredibly boring, but when you want men to perform in a, measured manner when you want them to be able to control themselves and be drilled under battle this is absolutely what you need and i think this is why the mamluks were the greatest soldiers of the medieval age and again when we start to look at the battles with the mongols you know you've got the most superior bowmen of the medieval age suddenly meeting their nemesis hmm. because the very thing that they excel at they can't beat their opponents at the Mongols become deadly at 50 meters with their bows. The Mamluks are deadly at 75 meters because they're pulling a bigger, harder, composite bow, much better crafted from a full industrial base, but also they have the power and the skill to pull it all day. They're only bringing two battle horses to the battle because their horses are of better condition and they understand them better, whereas the Mongols are riding small step ponies. They're bringing six of them to the battle. So the cycle of battle, the classic Mongol battle of wearing down your opponent by the first wave coming forward, shooting its arrows as a shower at about 100 meters and then retiring between the flanks on either side. And then the second wave coming forward essentially gets broken by the Mamluks for two reasons. They've got a higher rate of fire. They can fire three arrows in one and a half seconds. They're holding the knocks of the arrows, you know, the very base of the arrows at the feathers in their trailing fingers. 
in their little finger and in their ring finger because they're using a thumb and a forefinger draw for power. Crazy. They've also got wide splayed quivers on both sides of their bodies that they can pull. They can shoot off the wrong side of the bow, but they're also wearing heavier armor than the Mamluk, sorry, than the Mongols because they've got, again, a better industrial base, long history of lamellar um, armor that the Mongols later adopt actually in the 14th century. Um, But also they're coming forward. They're not confused by the charge of the Mongols because they're Turks themselves. Mm. They're used to undertaking great hunts. Their pastime is polo. When they're not doing polo, they're shooting their bow in something called the uh, kabak. The kabak is where you shoot through a high loop or a high ring placed high above the hippodrome and you try to place the arrow into a gourd on top of a pole. There's a lovely story of the Sultan uh, Khalil. He was the the Sultan who finally destroyed the last Crusader um, cities and actually finished the Crusader uh, Kingdom of Uthruma in 1291. He went with some friends into the Hippodrome to uh, shoot the Tibak. And what he did as a novelty is as you shot into the gourd, it broke the gourd apart and a dove would be released as well. I mean... I know it's only a small story, but it shows the obsession with the military Mm. arts that these people had. Definitely. They would spend their time and their evenings discussing the furacea, and the furacea is a combination of three things. It talks about veterinary science, it talks about military science, but it also talks about martial science. So it's very like the Bushido of the samurai, Mm -hmm. but I think it's more than that. Because, it, you know, it even goes into the treatment of wounds. It even goes into the psychological management of individuals who have become panic-stricken during a battle. Wow. Such is the depth. In some ways, the Fura series is a little bit outdated as well. It, it, it talks about Greek and Roman techniques of warfare. It talks about classical Islamic weapons such as, I think it's called the Uhud, a huge heavy mace that nobody would used for centuries hmm. But it was probably used to round out conversations over a few glasses of wine or a few anecdotes thrown here. But why did you do it that way? Ah, oh, well, because it was done in this way in 825 by the great Caliph. You know, it's, it's that. But it also has the most amazing battle plans, crisscrossing the battle from, you know, taking a flank attack that comes in and sweeps in to take out the standard bearers of the Mam- of the Mongols, etc., things like this. But also when you look at the archery treatises, they're very similar to Koyodo in Japan. Again, the, the art of the bow in Japan. You must enter as if you are entering the mosque. You must take on a countenance of reverence. You must tie your sleeve in the right way. You must grip the bow. And there's 13 different descriptions of how to grip the bow to suit you. There's descriptions of how to find um, arrows in the sand with your bare feet. I mean, it's, mm. it's, 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 that, it's that depth of a military caste that really makes the Mamluks distinctly different, even from the great warriors of Salahaddin's time, I think. Yeah. Um, the Ottomans revered them. If you visit the Topkapi Sarai now, you cannot decide. There's a few that you know. Some of the battle standards of the Mamluks are there. And we must remember that the Ottomans defeated the Mamluks. You know, they mm. destroyed them essentially in 1517. But they were revered as the greatest romantic warriors of Islam, as the bravest of the brave, that the fact that they would take on the Ottoman artillery and guns in a charge of bows. It's mm. like, it's a bit, it's a bit cheesy to say, mm. like the last samurai, you know, but it, it feels like that. Mm. But also you cannot sometimes decide in Topkapi Sarai between whether this is actually a Mamluk helmet of the t- period or whether it is a fake made for an Ottoman emir right. to mimic his heroes. Wow. And the swords are the same. Mm. There are some that we know are distinctly, and the battle standards we do know that this particularly was Cape Bai or this was Al Ghuri, et cetera, of the later Mamluk sultans. But, you know, if, if they tell you this is the sword of Babers, you really can't be sure or not. <laughs> But the, sure. these things were revered. And, and the Sirat Babers, this folkloric tale that still runs in the Middle East and is still told in, well, I hope it's still told in coffee houses in Damascus. I haven't been in Damascus since oh, 2000 and 
2008 probably, uh, long before the war, mm. and I was very fortunate to do so. But in the Nafara coffee house in the corner of Damascus, they still... The man in his fez, the storyteller, he still raises his sword. Wow. He still shouts, as Zahir Bahabas, and everybody gets excited because they know the story that's coming. But it's not just Babas' uh, victory at al Bustalan. It's not just his victory over the Crusaders. It's not just Angelut. There's a lot of fantasy stories in there as well about him crossing the bridge um, again, I cannot remember the name of the Siddhat at Bebiz, the bridge that is as narrow as the blade of a sword into heaven and so on and so mm. forth. There's, there's, it's, it's incredibly strong. For us, Salah Adin is often, you know, the Islamic hero of the Crusades yeah. because of Dante, because of Scott, because of the troubadours. But in the Middle East, it's definitely Babers, absolutely number one, um, followed by Kalawun as well, because they destroy the Crusader kingdom. Mm. They defeat the Mongols. They bring another new golden age of Islam when it's been in a lot of trouble for a long period of time. Mm. Um, and also, when you look at the artwork that comes out of the Mamluk Sultanate as well, if anyone is ever in the Louvre, definitely go in to see the Baptiste, uh, Baptiste de Saint-Louis. It is one of the most amazing pieces of medieval metalwork in the entire world. Also, in, in Venice, you will see... Um, ewers, water jugs, and so on from the Mamluk period. In the Louvre, in Abu Dhabi, actually, now because they have this extended relationship, they're absolutely beautiful pieces as well. And I think it's part of that interest in artisanship from weapons spilling over into metalwork. Right. But it's also the fact that they create literally a haven from the Mongol storm for artisans from all over the Islamic world that are running, you know, they're like refugees and they're running like crazy to escape this, this scourge that's coming. The Mongols were not, they're not going to cut your head off if you're an artisan, let's be very honest mm. about it, but they are going to transplant you and take you somewhere where you don't want to be. Mm. They did the same in China. They often kidnapped artisans, took them beyond the, um, the border and then created their own cities where they could use them to create goods for the Mongol kingdom as well. Mongol Empire, one should say. So I think um, the, I don't know if we have to demystify the Mamluk Sultanate too much. I'm, I'm quite cautious when I write about them. Of course, they were not always uh, the greatest um, avatars of chivalry. <laughs> they were known for treachery, Babers in particular. We know him, he's twice a regicide. He kills the fast, the last Ayyubid successor of Saladin's line. Mm. He wades into the river at the siege of Al Mansur and he stabs him in the back. And then he, the uh, last emir of Saladin's line in, in the Egyptian line is hacked to pieces by another emirs. He's not very popular for this act at all. In fact, uh, after the dust settles, he has to flee because uh, once the Mamluks start to fight amongst themselves over who should become the Sultan, he's actually seen as somebody has really caused a lot of trouble here. Right. And also, he's a very junior emir, in fact. He's not one of the seniors. He's very mm. impressive during the siege uh, of, of al Mansura. He, he leads the crusaders in foolhardily inside the city. He then takes a uh, small groups of Mamluks and they destroy the Crusaders, um, the king's brother. Uh, so it's Louis the Ninth. Uh, sorry, again, to, to go backwards a little bit. Louis the Ninth in 1250 with his crusade, which essentially fails at that point because um, I think it's Robert of Anjou charges into the city with a bunch of Crusader knights. But it's fairly obvious that Babus has let them in because mm. he knows once he closes the gates that, yeah, okay, normally classic that we think of the heavy armoured um, crusader knight with his broadsword, his triple link chain mail, he's fairly indestructible, he's like a tank. But the Mamluks are not the lightly armoured um, bowmen that we've seen in the past in crusades history. They're heavily armoured. They can use axes, they can use maces, they can use swords. They're skilled in every single one of these. And they're also incredibly skilled in pyrotechnics. 
They're really very good with explosives. They're good with napalm or naft. They've got grenades that will drop fire all over you. They can shoot fire darts from tubes from their bows, five or six of those. Um, And we know from accounts from the Crusaders that they were wearing heavy felt cloaks and they were constantly having to put out fire burning all over their bodies against this absolute storm. But not only that, the Mamluks knew how to d- deploy that and then advance after it. Mm. So you've got this firestorm that knocks you out of condition, and then suddenly you've got suddenly ar- somebody arriving with an axe on still on his horse wading through you, <laughs> and then he's looped back on you, and then you're getting arrows as he's riding away from the Parthian shot. So they're absolutely mm. – I don't know what we call it now. The Americans had a beautiful term for it. It's almost like linked-up warfare, if you know what I mean. They're, mm. they're deploying so beautifully in every aspect, and, and I think that's the key to their victory over the Mongols as well, is that they can do what the Mongols can do so much quicker – but they can also do it with this heavier aspect of once you get close, we've also got the advantage that mm. we're like a heavy crusader knight as well. Mm. And we can take you on with the lance, the boonid, again, another one of those exercises in the Hippodrome that they did all day, all day, all day. You had to be able to take rings off of small um caps as you rode past at the gallop and then on a high one as well and i think at some point you had to knock something off of somebody's head i presume Hmm. it wasn't the instructor who was standing there with something on (laughs) some stupid volunteer that decided um but again in in the furusia it talks repeatedly about the pairing of weapons as well what goes well with the lance. Well, you need something shorter like the kanjar, the long dagger that every Mamluk always carried at his side. It looks a little bit like the Gurkha Chris. Mm-hmm. You know, it has a long, heavy blade that becomes wider as it goes on. And it's perfect because it's like a short stabbing sword, but it's also a slashing weapon. It's also possible to finish off an enemy who's on the ground with it. But it's also perfectly balanced with things like a mace with like a javelin. Mm-hmm. The Furusir never discusses the use of the bow. Oh no, mm-hmm. sorry. It never discovers it never discusses the carrying of the bow because this is ubiquitous. It's just okay. you, you're always going to have your bow. You're right. a Mamluk. You're yeah. never going to leave it. You never see a single piece of metalwork, you never see a single piece of art without a ma- with a Mamluk without a bow at his side mm-hmm. unless he's just wearing a light silk top and doing some acrobatics to amuse people. Right. It's, it's really like that. You've got the Hanja on one side of your body, you've got the bow on the other, and that's it. You're always going to be having those. And it's, it's, sure. it's, it's just central, central. Right, right. So I remember you saying, well, actually maybe I read it in your article before, one Mameluk soldier was worth a thousand ordinary soldiers or something. Was that – so you can see where that comes from, obviously. With so much training, you've got a combination of this kind of wave of attacks and different types of warfare that combine – the heavy cavalry charge of like a European knight alongside the the bows that we usually associate with, as you said, with Mongols rather than Mamluks. So can you tell me a bit about, so we've got Baybars, he's coming up as a junior officer, he's caused quite a bit of trouble. Can you tell me how he kind of rises to fame and how we get to Angelut and, the, you know, the big battle that he's famous for? Yeah, I mean, in theory, it's not really his battle. It's Kutters, who I think we should really sympathize with because he wins the battle. And then in a hunting party, Babers kills him. So he's now twice a regicide. The, the issue is that in the early Mamluk Sultanate, and I don't think it ever really goes away, despite this pyramid that I've been describing of loyalty to the Ustad and then 10 Mamluks below this Mamluk and then 40 Mamluks below this. And it sounds perfect, doesn't it? But there are, of course, tribal loyalties that lie deeper. Mm. But there's also the fact that Kutus, for example, had actually been part of an organization called the Muzia because his last master was a Sultan Muiz. Well, Muiz died during um, the early period of, of, of chaos of, of, of the politics, the first 10 years of the Mamluk Sultanate. Babers wasn't. He was from the Bahria. He was from the river battalion. They were on a small island. They were barracked on a small island in the middle of the Nile. Of the Nile, the Nile's so big that the Muslims are traditionally called it Bayer or Sea because it's right. so huge that they look at it the sea. So Bahria is actually that kind of regiment. So there's a loyalty there as well. 
So Babers probably took a little bit of a risk. I think the killing of the last Ayub Sultan may have been an agreement amongst all of the Mamluk emirs. Mm -hmm. There was certainly a threat to them that this guy had come down from Syria. He wasn't known to them at all. He was acting a little bit crazy. There is a story that he was running around with his sword in the middle of the night, cutting the heads off candles and shouting, so shall I deal with the Mamluks, etc. But right. I think what really happened was that the Mamluks essentially realized that this was their time. The lines of Saladin were dying out. The Ayyubid dynasty had come to an end in Egypt, Egypt, essentially, with the death of the last sultan, who mm -hmm. was their last master. So a little bit like samurai, when you have no master, you go a little bit roman, right? You go mm -hmm. a little bit rogue. You, you make your own destiny. And right. I think that's what Babers was essentially doing. He, I think he then miscalculated that his power base was not large enough. So when Khutuz seized power with a clique or a junta of other officers, they fled. Babers went with his um, followers and they, they left and they went up to Syria where they hung out a little bit with some of the Ayyubid minor emirs who were holding Aleppo, Damascus. And I think he ended up, if I remember correctly, in Homs, actually, right up in the north of Syria, where, of course, he was seeing that the Mongols were gathering and it was this, this storm was coming. As early as 1254, the caliph in Baghdad had written to the Mamluks in Cairo to warn them that the Mongol storm was coming. Mm -hmm. So the whole of the Middle East knew, and it was sort of beginning to glue itself together to some degree. And there was a lot of fear around. Babur spends some time up there in Syria. It sounds like time goes really slow now, doesn't it, for mm -hmm. about six years before the mm -hmm. Mongols truly mm -hmm. turn up. But of course... The Mongol blitzkrieg wasn't a blitzkrieg at this point. It took them a very long time to roll across Persia. They were very thorough in their preparations. Bridges were built. Um, pasture was preserved ahead of time. This was a mass movement of people. Mm. It wasn't just an invasion. They came to stay. Mm. Um, so it was moving quite slowly, which was lucky for the folks in the Middle East, although Anatolia was taken. The Battle of Kozi Day takes place. Essentially, the whole of Anatolia becomes a, Momluk, uh, sorry, a Mongol protectionate or protectorate, um, and everyone knows that they're in trouble. So Babers is up there really being soldiers of fortune. Mm -hmm. And I think I wrote in, in my first book, Knights of Islam, that they acted a little bit like those free companies in the Hundred Years' War with the English in France, where, yeah, we're working for the English king, but we're kind of working for ourselves, essentially. So a lot of booty, a lot of raiding, probably being pretty mean to civilians, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest, and a lot of slave uh, running, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. He then apparently falls out with his employer in northern Syria and beats one of his ministers in the presence of this minor Ayyubid emir for not showing enough resistance to the uh, Mongols. I, I must be honest, I have sympathy with anybody sitting up in the north of Syria at this point. I think I would have tried to make friends with them as well. Right. <laughs> so he leaves there and he returns to Cairo under a truce of good faith from Qutuz, who needs everybody he can possibly find at this point. There's probably only around 20,000 to 24,000 cavalrymen in the whole of Egypt at this point. Wow. Um, the Mongols sweep down pretty, fairly quickly. Homs goes over to them, and um, as does Aleppo as well, quite bloodily, but Homs is saved. Um, the Ayyubid uh, emirs, the descendants of Saladin, essentially join as auxiliaries, as does Armenia and Georgia. Uh, Antioch under Bohemond um, becomes a semi-ally and also gets excommunicated by the Pope, actually, for doing this. Funny that. So Western attitudes towards the, towards the Mongols were not entirely um, unsuspicious, shall we say. I mean, mm. you know, there's this old story of Prester John that existed for many centuries in the Crusader literature, that this idea that this Christian king somewhere out to the east of the Muslims would come and save Utrama. Um, and there were some thoughts that the Saljuk Turks, when they started moving with these people, because somebody was beating the Muslims somewhere in the east, and then the Karakitai, when they were pushed out of China, again, this story came back. And the Mongols, there was a real genuine feeling in Europe that, Prester John was on the march. Unfortunately, mm. the more they began to understand and know about the Mongols, was there wasn't such a good option at all. Even worse. <laughs> um, well, because the Mongols didn't really care, to be honest, about 
at this point in their in their history, certainly when world domination was essentially the destiny of the Mongols, um, their word for peace was ill, and, and ill does not mean peace at all. It means subjugation. There, there's no actual concept of partnership or even mild colonization. There's absolute subjugation and so mm. on. So Bohemond was playing a dangerous game, but he had run out of a lot of. Um, of, of, of options he was always seen even by the crusader um, kingdoms of jerusalem and, and the other counties and so on as a little bit of a renegade anyway mm-hmm. so they come on quite quickly babers returns and again kutus needs all the help he can get it's kutus's victory there's no doubt about that because he arranges with the crusaders to be able to march through their lands with safe passage he arranges the strategy that we will not wait in egypt because we need, we have, we have a, a good chance to take them on in Syria. We have another chance, then, if we lose in Syria, to fall back to Egypt. But if we lose in Egypt, we're done and we're finished. Mm-hmm. But also, if we march north, we've got a chance to cut across their lines of communication, because Syria, obviously, in the interior, is a very difficult place to actually occupy to descend mm. an to send an army as well. Even though the Mongols, sorry, yeah, the Mongols actually control Damascus at this point, which is a major, major. Mm. Um, issue uh, in terms of supplies and victualling and actually being able to hold on in the region. What Babers actually gives, I think, is that absolute cutting edge that Chutas needs. He rides forward of the army at Angelut. He destroys the Mongols' reconnaissance patrol, so they're essentially blinded. He brings back important information about the nature of the Mongol uh, layout and how they're actually going to lay out the forces in the valley of Angelut, the, uh, the uh, spring of um, the spring of Goliath down there, because it's, 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 it's a very dry valley. It runs essentially north to south, and the Mongols are going to line up north to south, and they're going to come across the valley. There were, has been some stories in the past that the Mongols were ambushed. This is not true. We know this from renditions of um, soldiers who fought with the Mongols on that day with their uh, Yubid princes of Homs, and they talk about telling the Mongol general Kitbuka that each Mongol banner, each Mamluk banner that comes into it identifies this particular emir and so on. Right. So, forth. so we know that the both forces are fully arrayed. But I think that what happens is that Kitbuka does not realize that the Mamluk army is as big as it is. It's mm-hmm. still not as large as the forces he's got in the field. But remembering that back to that Mongol civil war problem, he hasn't got all of Hulagu Khan's army with him. Mm, mm. He's probably only got about one third to about half of it. He's a great general, Kipuka, there's no doubt about it. This is no slouch. It's not going to be easy anyway. And also, um, Hulagu is sending reinforcements, but he's sending them a little bit late. Babers actually later destroys them, about 2,000 of them, north of the battle, after the battle, um, when, he's, when he pushes north to actually secure Aleppo and Homs, which are the key garrisons. Also, during the battle, it's interesting that Babers is on the left wing, and he's defeated really quickly, and he runs. Mm. And it's like, oh, this doesn't sound quite right, this great hero of Islam but I think he feigns retreat really skillfully. Mm-hmm. And the Mongols classically did, the Turks classically did this maneuver, this idea that you ride into the enemy, but just before they get there, you turn, you twist away, you give them the Parthian shot and you ride. And of course they get excited. It mm. seems strange that the Mongols should fall for this, yeah. but maybe they just did it so well that the left wing almost looks like it's collapsing. Hutus at that point, brings the entire bodyguard around him, his kasakia, his, his, his best Mamluks, his royal Mamluks, into the left flank. And that absolutely destroys the Mongol cycle. As I said, mm. what they do with the Mamluks is they're shooting, but they're coming forward at the same time. They're shooting, they're coming forward, but then they're there with their heavy weapons as well. And their cycle of firing is so rapid. And they don't retire on these short circuits like the Mongols do because they don't need to because they're riding really top quality Arab horses, well kept in stables, loved and looked after. Mm. Whereas the Mongols are riding poor little step ponies. I don't know if you've ever seen any TV footage of Mongol horse racing. It still goes on in Mongolia. 
the rate of attrition is frighteningly high, right? These horses die on the track and they do CPR on them by kicking them in the chest. It's pretty, pretty brutal, you know, to say the least. Um, that is enough. But Kip Booker just about manages to pull the battle back. Again, he's, he's no slouch. This is a great mm. general. He's not sent there. He's, he's, he's Hulagu's number one lieutenant. At that point, it really does, does make the difference, the discipline, because... For any Western army to achieve what the Mamluks did on the battlefield that day would have been near impossible without infantry on the field. Even the Normans, you know, the greatest of the Western warriors in the Crusades period, in order to organize a charge, reorganize a charge, would have had to go behind their infantry, form up as knights, and then come forward together. The charge must be delivered as a solid mass of men. Hmm. If you arrive piecemeal, you'll be cut to pieces. So what they do right there on the battlefront, after Hutter stabilizes the left, is the center then reorganizes itself in the flux of a hot cavalry battle Crazy. to organize a unified charge and flatten the Mongols. And from that very point on, it becomes slaughter. Hmm. Because the Mongols are completely broken. They also get, well, not bad luck, perhaps. There's two stories. One, either the Ayyubid princes of Homs take this as, oh, it's time to desert, and they run, mm -hmm. or it's been prearranged. There are some stories, again, that those old contacts of Babers in the north of Syria, he knows these princes. Mm -hmm. He fought with them on a daily basis, whether it was just, you know, skirmishing battles, whether it was just raids or whatever. He knows them. And there's, there's stories that perhaps there's a few Mamluk infiltrators in there been left behind who say, you know, this, this would be a good time. Maybe there's some messages passed before mm. the battle, et cetera, et cetera. It, I don't think it is prearranged because it happens quite late in the battle. Right. I think they do sit there and think, which way is this going? Mm. And then they realize which way it's going, and it's a really good time to desert. desert. Mm. But uh, mm. It may have, may have been some degree of, you know, tugging on your shoulder or whatever, or shouting across the battlefield, mm. hey, you remember me? You know, <laughs> it does happen, right? Or it did happen for sure. Um, so Babers is, it's not his victory. It's definitely Hutus's, but he is a major, major component of it. But then he is the founder of the Mamluk state. No doubt about it from there on in. He's obviously one of those individuals who has an incredibly clear vision of what needs to be achieved very quickly. All the bases, mm. the base is there. Mm. But even the even the Mamluk army that defeats the Mongols at the Second Battle of Homs in 1280 under the Sultan Kalawun is Babus's creation. Mm. Kalawun mm. is not a bad general again. He's not that inspiring. He's not that fantastic. He's been there at all the great events with Babus at his shoulder. But it's Babus's army that wins it because, again, the entire left wing of the army again i think is destroyed mm. but the mm. army recovers and then it pushes forward and it folds the mongols with a massive right wing swing with even bedouin cavalry out on the right and crushes it into an advancing bodyguard of the royal mamluks mm. again this degree of discipline i think what did wellington say that everything at waterloo was one on the playing fields of Eton or whatever, meaning that you drill and you move soldiers around and so on. But this degree of command and control in the medieval period is absolutely miraculous. Mm, mm. I mean, what happens at the Battle of Homs in 1280 is the right wing of the Mongols that have defeated the Mamluk left wing go down to Lake Homs and have a lie down and have a picnic because huh. they think they've won the mm. battle. So mm. they're, they're, their generals completely lost control of them. That never happens no, it does happen to the, to the Mamluks once, but it very rarely happens because, again, these men live their lives living in each other's pockets. Mm -hmm. They come through as boys. They become men together. They become soldiers together. This idea of the kushtia, uh, kushtia or your comrades, the people who are, were of the same master or you were in the same tibak, in the same barracks, in the same training school. Again, Babers has a ready-made government. He mm. promotes into all the senior positions guys that he went through his training with because mm. he trusts them absolutely. Mamluk politics can be very bloody. It can be very um, internecine at times, particularly when the Sultan dies because there's no established pattern of inheritance. In theory, mm. no Mamluk can inherit the throne from his father. Babers, again, oddly enough, tries this with his son Baraka, but it only lasts a few months and he's mm -hmm. deposed. 
sent into retirement in a castle. Kalurun takes power under a, with a new junta of Mamluks under his control, and so it goes on like mm. this. Again, many, many times sultans try to put their sons on the throne. But in fact, the son of a Mamluk can't even become technically a Mamluk. He becomes right, a free a man, slave. becomes a regular citizen uh, of the right. city. Right. Only very, very late on in the empire are these individuals formed into regiments, but they're formed into regiments of riflemen. Right. Not because it's a second-rate Thing the Mamluks appreciated firearms. There was a lot mm. of controversy saying they were very old fashioned and they weren't interested in firearms and cannons, and that's why the Ottomans were superior to them at the end. Um, the biggest problem was actually access to the technology. Mm. They did mm. have a massive interest in firearms, it didn't really suit their battle style, of course. It's quite difficult to shoot a breech loading musket and reload it when you're mm. on a horse. Um, but they did apply mixed regiments in the field. They were very successful against the Portuguese in the Red Sea um, using uh, uh, riflemen on ships. Mm -hmm. um, and they continued their interest in military technology. They were not um, some antediluvian backward military clique, you know, that wanted to live in the 13th century. Sure. Um, but they were, they were, uh, there was a short, certainly shortage of technology in the Middle East for firearms, uh, which the Ottomans obviously had contact with in the Balkans. But also the Ottomans had access to copper from Austria um, for the forming of, of cannon, which the Mamluks did not have. There's not a lot of copper in the Middle East. So, so we've we've spoken about um, Angelut and Baybars's rise to power. So, can you tell me a bit about the downfall of him and the downfall of the Mamluk estate? You mentioned um, being superseded by the Ottomans. Was it just the firearms that eventually led to their fall, or? Um, there's, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. I don't know if we can really talk about the downfall of Babers. I mean, he died at the height of his success. True, right. I right. mean, the story that I like, I don't know if it's true, was that he had two glasses of wine, one poisoned, one not poisoned, gave the wrong wine to the minor, minor Ayyubid prince that he was going to have killed hmm. and drank it himself. I'm not sure that I'm, I, I believe. He died around the age of 50 in 1277 in Cairo. Uh, so he didn't die in battle. Um, a very complex individual, as I say, you know, the champion of Sunni Islam, but he kept his own Sufi of his own who would make uh, fortune telling, which is absolutely illegal or absolutely, yeah, illegal is probably a good word in Islam. You know, fortune telling mm. is absolutely frowned upon. It's like witchcraft. It's absolutely beastly. Right. What doing. Um, he married a Karawazinian princess, not an Egyptian or not an Arab. Um, he basically ruled from his battle charger rather than his palace, but his mausoleum, which oddly enough is in, in Damascus rather than in Cairo, even though he died in Cairo, um, is now the National Library of Syria. So he's a very, very strange contradiction. Mm. Um, but I say his inheritance for the Mamluks was great governance, absolutely rock-solid military, normal relations with Western powers and with Eastern powers, an espionage service which continued to give information back from beyond the borders of the Mongol Empire right up until 1336, about wow. 15 years after the Mongol Empire had actually collapsed in Persia. Crazy. Um, guidance on how to manage things like espionage. You know, he would even tell all of his um, lieutenants, always bring the spies in individually and interview them, never interview them together because they will come together to give you some false story. Mm, what mm. you want to hear is the independent. So it sounds a little bit Stalin-esque in a way. CIA, it? yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, and certainly well, one thing we know about Babers is he's very paranoid. He slept incredibly badly. He had mm. very bad night terrors, etc. But again, in his demeanor and his, in his daily management of life he was absolutely confident absolutely on the ball you know you wouldn't challenge him. an incredible polo player absolute fascination with the um uh, martial arts but again some of the most beautiful harans that we have the most beautiful metalwork the most beautiful glasswork that we have from the islamic times and periods is absolutely from the mamluk empire so mm -hmm. these guys were um becoming cultured, so to speak. They were mm. like a clique outside of Egyptian society, distinctly proud of their heritage. They were the only people who were allowed to eat horse 
honoring certain, and they used to keep the tribal ceremonies as well as the Islamic uh, holidays as well. Right. They, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> they distinctly, at one point in history, um, stated that nobody who was a Mam- Mamluk should ride a horse because this was the mark of this individual clique. Right. And they were sometimes seen as oppressive by the population, but they were also seen very much as the defenders of Islam and also um, as this flowering of the military arts, that they were chivalric in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, Lachin, who has always had a bad reputation as one of the worst Mamluk sultans because of his reputation for political skullduggery, actually was one of those individuals who opened maristans or hospitals, who fed the poor, who, you know, essentially washed the feet of the poor, Mm. did his penance according to the pillars of Islam, and was an incredibly religious man. His politics inside Mamlukdom didn't have no effect on the population of Egypt Mm. whatsoever. He was seen as a kind and benevolent ruler, Mm. absolutely bloodthirsty inside the politics, though. So they're very strange. And I think Babers, again, sets that pattern, too. Yeah. He's this this very complex dichotomy uh, uh, of things. Why do the Mamluks finish in the end? Well, I mean, I've... I've written about this from a, a number of directions, including from the Chinese direction. And I think we have to give a lot to the Europeans for going to the oceans. I think we have to give a huge amount to the Italians for dominating the Eastern Mediterranean with new shipbuilding technologies, with the bravery and the um, ability to sail in winter and to dominate that period. I think that the Mamluks as well, remember, are basically a uh, land-based horse riding, step-based tradition, Mm. clique. They don't have an enormous amount of interest in the Navy. The Navy's fallen a long way anyway. Saladin did quite a lot to rehabilitate it in the Crusades period, but it was never matching the Europeans. And it's noticeable too. Actually, I mean, oddly enough, in one of the late surges of the Mamluks, they invade Cyprus at one point, which seems wow. very unusual for a, for, a, for a nation with very poor naval credentials. And they do quite well, but it's literally a raid. They mm. don't stay. They, mm. they, they can't stay. And Alexandria is very badly um, raided by the Crusaders at one point as well. And the Mamluk response takes days to actually kick them out and get rid of them. Mm. So I think that's one part. And it's noticeable... And it starts under under Babers, a psychological turning in occurs. Mm. Rather than re-fortifying the coast after they take Acre, after they take Jaffa, after they take Asuf, after they take the Crusader castles and cities, they actually devastate the coast. Mm. They want no landing place for a Crusader to arrive. But again, psychologically, that's quite a statement to make to yourself. Mm. Mm. That we're we're quite scared of the people from the sea. Actually, is what they're really mm. saying, right? Um, even late in in the fifth, in the fifteenth yeah, century, Alexandria continues to be fortified again and again and again. They're quite scared of the Crusaders making mm. these maritime raids from Sicily and from Italy and so right. on and so forth. There is also a massive psychological scarring right across Islam that is really hard to understand now perhaps from the mongol invasions um i think it's ibn alathir he had to be convinced by friends to even write about the mongol invasions he couldn't bring himself to do it wow it was so massive it was like people would talk about the fact that in an entire village there were six people left alive that men were pulling the plows because every single animal had been killed by the Mongols. There were stories that you shouldn't, um, certain Mongol generals, if they looked into a puddle of water or into a small pond of water, the water would retain their evil image. Wow. The, 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 the blow was enormous. 
I think, and that fractioning that occurs in the great Islamic empire after that period is never recovered again, mm. to be honest. I mean, there's a lot of dynamics that we, we could talk about that are not really directly related about the, the decay of the great Arab conquests of the early, um, up to, from the 8th century onwards, with Turkification and the re reestablishment of Persian identity and so on. But the Mongols really do an enormous amount of damage to the Middle East. And of course, it doesn't fully end with them. Mm. You've got the um, black and white sheep Turks that take on the, what's left of the Mongol Empire, the broken apart parts of it. And then Timur Leng returns again, mm. or doesn't return, sorry, as a Chinggisid or a descendant of the Chinggisid. He marries into the Chinggisid line. I think he marries a granddaughter of Ching, uh, Chinggis Khan, or maybe even a great granddaughter. I'm not terribly sure. But his you know, destruction right down into Baghdad, the Towers mm. of Skulls, the burning of the great mosque of Damascus once it's been filled with the population. It goes on. It mm. doesn't end with with Hulagu Khan. It doesn't end with Agaba Khan. It doesn't end with Ghazan Khan even. It kind of ends when the Ottomans and the Safavids are the great power blocks mm. and there's some degree of stability in the Middle East. Against the Ottomans, um, the Mamluks are relatively successful for a period of time. Again, they, 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 they defeat the Ottomans as far north as Ayas in um, what is for the Ottomans a very much botched maritime invasion. They try to bring the Ottoman fleet alongside the Ottoman um, army marching down the coast right up in the top of northern Syria, and it fails quite spectacularly against some really quite magnificent Mamluk um, resistance. But I think what happens at the end is Mamlukdom itself begins to fall apart, that the Sultan himself cannot absolutely guarantee control of Syria. When mm. he's in Cairo, there are constant revolts occurring in Syria. And again, eventually northern Syria goes over to the Ottomans um, and one of the senior emirs is taken um, down by Selim, Selim the Grim, who is fantastically well named, the Ottoman Sultan. He even calls him the traitor, his uh, Ottoman um, emir that's assisting him and advising him and so on and so forth. And it eventually, it, they cannot resist in Syria. The Ottomans, I think, are technologically superior. Although in the first battle of the pyramids um, in 1516, I think... Um, Tuman Bey attempts to deploy the last uh, Mamluk Sultan, attempts to deploy his troops with fixed artillery, fixed infantry, and kind of gives away everything that he's got on the field mm -hmm. as an advantage. In fact, he tries to play the Ottoman janissaries at their own game, and they're much better at it than him. Mm -hmm. In the final battle, he attempts um, more like a traditional cavalry type attack, but there's too few of them left. There's very little left to be won. Um, and the Ottomans crush them, essentially. Poor Tuman Bey is executed. He's hung on the walls of Cairo. Um, the story goes that he says to the population of Cairo, say the Fatiha with me, the first line of the Quran. Traditionally, it's said three times um, for any dying individual. It's a bit like having the last rites right. read into your ear if you're a Catholic. Um, and the populace weep. They, they mm. weep for him. They can't believe, you know, one, that he's so noble, that he's chivalric, but also they've got used to this. Mm. You know, the Mamluks have been around from 1250 to 1517. It's another one of those anomalies of of the um, medieval period that the, the Mongols are much better remembered, but they last a lot shorter period, yeah. much more extensively geographically, but they last actually longer than the Crusader kingdom. Mm. And we know how many volumes of books have been written about the Crusader kingdom. Yeah. Whole libraries yeah. have been written about it. <laughs> um, but it doesn't last terribly long. Um, um, and Mamluk becomes, uh, Mamlukdom becomes a distinct culture. There are writers, uh, I've not investigated it myself because I, I don't tend to go beyond Napoleon turning up in the Middle East in, in my interest in, in history or any, any degree of expertise um, in the Middle East in that period. But some modern writers uh, talking about the modern state of Egypt have actually said that the Mamluk system still exists very much there. 
of, wow. of patronage, of pyramid, of military dominance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not sure. That's interesting. I'm not, yeah. I'm not really uh, expert enough about modern um, hi- uh, history periods to, 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 to discuss this, but it, it's interesting that their legacy certainly continues. And as I said, the Babers is is much more remembered in the Middle East than mm. Saladin, actually, despite the statue in Damascus and the, the attempts of Saddam Hussein to pretend he was an Iraqi. You know, so, mm. um, Babers is really, really the one. Right. Well, it's a fascinating story. Anyone interested can learn more in James Waterson's book, The Knights of Islam, The Wars of the Mamluks. You might also recognize him from the Netflix series Mehmet vs. Vlad. James, thanks again for joining me on the show. Thank you to the show's patrons, Philip, Angus, Seth, Alex, Malcolm, Tom, and Claudia. And to everyone else, thanks for listening.